Okay, the recording has now started. Thank you for joining us for Finding Your Focus, a strategy webinar hosted by IDEA, the International Diaspora Engagement Alliance. My name is Sarah Gallagher, and I'm the Program Officer for IDEA. In case you're new to us, a bit of background. We are a public-private partnership between the U.S. Department of State, USAID, and Calvert Foundation, which is the managing partner. IDEA harnesses the passion, energy, and resources of diaspora individuals and diaspora organizations in contributing back to their countries of heritage through investment and entrepreneurship, philanthropy, volunteerism, and innovation. We're also committed to helping build the capacity of diaspora organizations and entrepreneurs in, to enable them to better serve their constituents and to make a greater impact back home. That's why we're excited to host this webinar as part of a series of capacity development trainings throughout 2015. To learn more about these webinars and our other programming, you can visit our website at diasporaalliance.org and sign up for membership. Membership is free and it provides access to resources such as these trainings, networking opportunities, and more. We're thrilled to have on this call two stellar speakers. First, we have Beth Bafford, who is Director of Investments at Calvert Foundation. Prior to, to joining Calvert Foundation, Beth was a consultant in McKinsey & Company's DC office, where she focused mostly on US health reform strategy for large health insurers and hospital systems. We also have Almaz Nagash, who is the founder of the African Diaspora Network, which harnesses the knowledge and resources of Africans in the diaspora to positively impact the lives of Africans and the communities in which we live. Almaz is also the managing director of Step Up Silicon Valley, a collaborative initiative of businesses, academic institutions, local governments, and NGOs working toward the shared goal of reducing poverty in Silicon Valley. Today's webinar has two central goals. One, to help listeners think about their organization's strengths and unique value propositions, as well as when and how to partner in order to complement areas of low capacity. Two, we hope that we can help listeners apply these learnings to a case study. So we'll use the African Diaspora Network as an example of how to use the, the strategy you learn in this webinar for your own organization. So with that, I'll turn it over to Beth, who will guide us through the, the bulk of the presentation. Beth? Thanks so much, Sarah, and hi, everyone. Uh, greetings from snowy DC. Uh, excited to, to kind of walk you through some frameworks and thoughts about how to find your focus. Um, and so this, the first slide you guys are seeing here on slide two, um, and, and so just, just a bit of background, as, as Sarah mentioned, um, I, I did some work prior to Calvert Foundation at McKinsey, so um, did work with really uh, large health insurers, health systems, um, big for-profit institutions, um, where you do kind of really in-depth strategy work. Um, and so we're basically taking some of those frameworks, dusting them off, uh, and looking at how you develop strategy for an organization um, and how we can tailor that to kind of help you guys start to think about your strategy and your focus and your strengths to really maximize the impact of your, your organizations in your communities. And so we'll start just with that kind of broader lens. And so on, on slide two here, you see kind of the full process of strategy making, uh, if you will. And so you'll see on the left, um, you know, you start with framing, um, moving into diagnostic, diag diagnosing kind of yourselves and your industry. You then look at forecasting, so understanding trends and scenario planning. Uh, then moving on to kind of data collection and insights, um, which is um, really important as you develop your strategy. Um, the next step is really choosing. So that, that means putting a stake in the ground and saying, you know, wh what your strategy is going to be. Then committing to that, uh, really understanding how that strategy turns into a work plan throughout your organization. And then evolving that strategy over time as things change and the industry shifts. Um, and really course correcting as, as needed. And so that's kind of the broader framework on, on how you develop strategy um, uh, that, that most of you, you know, might have seen these, these kinds of frameworks for that larger effort. Today, we're gonna focus on where the orange lines are. So we're really gonna focus on a few key parts of that, um, really understanding yourselves, your strengths, um, and your capabilities, understanding, understanding the market context or the community in which you work, uh, understanding on how that might be moving or shifting, 
um, and using that as a tool to understand how you really focus your time and resources. Um, and so this, uh, the webinar today is really just that. It's, it's one tool or it's one way to think about your organization's strategy. And it's really meant to be a first step to get organized. Uh, I know um, Sarah and Lee and everyone have you know, told me how, how, must, how many of you are doing uh, a ton of amazing things, um, but are constantly constrained by time and resources. And so really this is meant to kind of help you focus your efforts um, to the things that you're, you're good at um, and the things that your community really needs. And so in a way, this is just as much about what to say no to as what to say yes to uh, when you think about planning and organization for your, um, uh, for your organizations across the country. So the basic premise that we'll walk through is essentially do what you're good at, understand the need, need of your communities, and partner with others to fill those gaps. Um, and so that's kind of the framework that we'll, we'll use today. Um, understand what you're good at, understand the needs of the market, and then figure out where there are gaps and how you can partner. Uh, and then once we walk through that framework, uh, we're gonna go through, like Sarah said, a live case study uh, with the Af African Diaspora Network to really understand how an organization would think through these core questions. So moving on to slide three. Um, first, we really start with the strengths and capabilities. So what, what is your organization good at? Um, and, and how do we understand that? You know, I think, I, I think people, uh, there, there's a few ways that we would think about how you understand your organization's greatest strengths. The first is kind of self-assessment or self-reflection. So ask your, yourself and your organization questions of, of what are your greatest strengths? You know, are there strengths in human capital, strengths in community assets, uh, strengths in networks and relationships? Um, so do some kind of self-assessment there. Second, second way to look at it would be resource allocation. So where are you currently spending your time and your resources, both human and financial? And then lastly, trying to look kind of externally uh, looking in. So what is attracting new resources? Where do other people see value and where are people putting human or financial resources against that? Um, and so in order to, to walk through those questions, I uh, just created a little bit of a kind of an exercise that you can go through with your organization. Uh, and so the first piece of that exercise is really breaking down your human capital. And so, um, looking at, uh, this is the little time card bucket, so looking at your time and, and the, your colleagues' time, um, where has that been spent over the past few weeks or a few months or even a few years if you're a more established organization? Um, I do this a lot in my, my day to day where I kind of look back at my calendar of the last few weeks and make sure that I'm spending my time effectively to reach the goals that I've set for myself for that year or, or that our team has set for ourselves for the year. Um, and so you can, can look and kind of just do a calendar check um, and really look back and say, you know, what meetings have I taken? Um, what workshops have I done? What kind of work have I produced? Um, you know, what, is, what does my time allocation say about my my organization's um, strengths and, and what I feel like I, I enjoy or, or like spending time on. The second piece of it is really breaking down your organization's budget. So I know some of you might have small budgets, some might have bigger budgets, but regardless, you know, what does that say about your strengths? What does that say about your organization's capabilities? Um, if you notice that 80% of your budget is uh, to buy food and refreshments for, for convenings, where you really get the community together to problem solve or to try to attack a problem or to, to organize, um, that says a lot about what you're, uh, what you're good at. You know, you're great at convening, you're great at figuring out who are the right people that should be at the table to solve the problems that you're trying to solve. And so that, even, even that spending, you know, that money spent on coffee um, says something about what you're doing. So really looking at your budget over the last quarter or the last year, and, and seeing what that says about your, uh, your organization's focus. And then lastly is this external piece. So what do your stakeholders say about your strengths? Um, 
do you have, uh, you know, have informal or formal conversations, interviews with people in your network who are um, either, you know, customers of yours, funders of yours, friends, colleagues, uh, and just ask them flat out, you know, what do you think we're good at? Um, what do you think we, we really, you know, where do you think we excel and where do you see us adding value? And then lastly, you kind of stitch all of those together and see if they're saying the same thing. So it's that your time allocation, your budget allocation, and the external validation or their, the kind of the external feedback, are they all pointing in the same direction? Um, if so, I think that's a great, great way to know exactly what your organization is good at, where, where, where you should really focus and double down. Um, if they're divergent, if, if you're kind of spending time and money and, uh, on different things, it might be a way to really look at, um, you know, which is mo more important and how you can better streamline those efforts. Um, and so taking each of those three pieces separately and then putting them together can kind of tell its own story about your organization's strengths and how aligned that is with your, your mission and mandate. Um, and so I'm going to pause there to see if there are any quick questions on this section before moving into the next section, um, which is about uh, understanding your community needs. And if you have questions, you can type them into the chat bucket on the left. I just want to do a quick pause because I parking a lot. Beth, this is Sarah. I have a quick question. Um, so if you're looking yep. at your budget and, you know, where you've been spending your time, for example, and I'll use the example you gave that you've been spending 80% you know, of time and resources on convening, but that's not supposed to be, you know, in your mission and your mandate, that's not supposed to be your, your, you know, main value proposition, or that's not supposed to be where you're spending your time. Um, how do you address that? And how do you think about if that means that you you need to sort of redirect your efforts, or if, if that's you know an emerging strength that you didn't know about before that you should be giving that much attention to. Yeah, I think you could come out either way. Um, I think if it if you have a set mission or a set mandate that um, does not include kind of what you're spending time or money on, I think it's a, a good point of reflection. Uh, to to kind of say you know which which direction do we want to go you know, we've come to a node um, we can either go left which is to say stick with our mission um, and try to redirect those resources um, or you say you know we should adapt our mission to to really recognize this new new strength or new kind of line of um, line of business if you will um, but I think you know what what that says is, you know every dollar and every hour of time, you know, has an opportunity cost. And, you know, when you're spending that on something that's not going towards your core mission um, or your core, you know, wh what you have set out to do, um, then you can, you know, it can be, can, even though it might be a great thing, uh, it can be considered kind of an opportunity lost. And so, you know, I think that it's it's a good time to really reflect on that and see whether or not there needs to be a kind of a shift in strategy or a shift in focus um, to make sure that those are more aligned. Right. Does that right. make sense? Yeah, it does. Thank you. And that was a question someone from the audience threw out that I think you just answered as well. Um, and, and I don't see any other. Yeah, questions when, there, the when there's a, a misalignment. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, if this is where you really. Yeah, I think this is there's this, this can be a great um, flag or a great uh, just kind of moment of um, reflection on, you know, if you see that that, you know, what you're doing and what you're saying are different, um, a, a time to really course correct um, and, uh, you know, kind of pause and understand how you get those two better, uh, to be better aligned. Great, thank you, great questions. Um, kind of walking through, we walked through first, um, really understanding how to find that focus, how to find that uh, that that area of strength. Um, really simple steps on just how to reflect on that. But I know that everybody moves at a mile, you know, 100 miles an hour, um, and you know, days and weeks fly by. And so this is just a way to take some easy steps to to um, see if that alignment's there. So then the next the next step on the other side 
is to really identify the market or, or the community um, or the need that your organization is trying to fill. Um, and so this is basically understanding, you know, taking yourself out of the, the organization, really understanding the context in which your organization operates. Um, and so some questions that we look at here are, you know, what is the market problem or issue that you are trying to solve? So, you know, what was, what was the impetus in, uh, initially of creating your organization or founding your organization? Um, what were you trying, what gap were you trying to, to fill? Or what problem were you trying to solve? Um, where do you see the community needs right now? Um, is there a need for human resources, financial resources, greater connective tissue between, between those resources? Um, you know, what, what, where do you see there are existing gaps um, that, that, that still exist? And so similarly, uh, you can look at, uh, you know, a little, a, a way to look at this and break it down is to really break it down by stakeholder. And so when you think about this, the broader market needs um, and you think about your stakeholders, th these are just uh, five examples of potential stakeholders. Um, you might have different ones. But, you know, you, you look at the needs of the funders out there. So you look at the needs of the grant makers or the, you know, sources of revenue for your organization. You know, put yourself in their shoes. What do they, what do they need? Um, what are they, you know, where are they prioritizing um, their resources? You look at your customers. You look at kind of who you're serving. Um, and and, and what, what are their needs? What, what does that say about kind of the market context that you're operating in? Um, understanding your peer organizations um, or in the, the for-profit world, you know, your competitors, um, you know, what, what are they, what are they up to? Uh, and what does that say about the, the needs of the gaps in the market? Um, looking at your colleagues and other industry leaders, kind of thought leaders who are active in, in your space. Um, and this, this will allow you to just do a little bit of a mapping of, kind of you know, what, what, in what world are you operating, and what does that say about um, what the what the market needs? Um, and that basically um, that that is this kind of that evolves, right? So that that will be a point in time. Now uh, it was probably a different point in time when you started your organization, and it will likely be a diff, you know it'll likely be different needs or different gaps five years from now. Um, and so really, you know, pausing to reflect on you know, the needs now and where you see those moving, where you see these trends. And this is the kind of forecasting bucket of that larger strategy picture, which is to say, you know, how has the market evolved? If we started five years ago, what are the big changes we've seen in the past five years? Um, what is the um, kind of the sentiment out there? What, what is the, the, the organizing or the driving force behind um, the diaspora engagement kind of movement right now? How are new entrants affecting the needs of the market? Um, how are new technologies or resources changing how that, uh, you know, how the market interacts uh, or how you connect with people? Um, you know, all things that I know are, are extremely important and, and will, will affect especially organizations like yours um, who are c consistently trying to just improve communication and connection between people uh, here in the U.S. and people in your home countries. Um, and so just kind of making sure that you, when you look at this kind of community needs or community mapping, that it's not a static picture, um, but it's one that is con consistently evolving uh, and, uh, you know, that you understand how, wh what, what those trends are today and how they might affect how you think about your work moving forward. So pausing there, so essentially we, we started with looking at, you know, some, some basic tools on how you look at the left, so you look at your strengths and your capabilities. Some basic tools on how you assess and how you kind of um, start to draw an outline around the, the market and the community needs all on the right. And then the basic equation that we look at is, is you know, what's missing? Um, what's that in the middle? So if, you're, if, you're, if the community needs X, Y, and Z, and you're really good at X, how do you find partners or other organizations or other people who can provide Y and G. Um, and that's the basic equation that we look at. I think one of the, the, the reasons why we break this out is because a lot of organizations, especially small organizations that are trying, you know, doing a lot 
a volu you know, volunteer based or trying to do a lot in their communities, they try to do everything. So they try to do X really well, they try to do Y really well, and they try to do Z really well. And in the process, um, usually can't do it all. Uh, either don't have the human resources or the financial resources to do it all. And so really understanding what your, you know, are you X, are you Y, or are you Z, um, can really help um, maximize the ability of you and the organizations you work with or you partner with um, to really meet the full needs of the community that you're serving. Uh, and so just a basic equation there on, on how to think about partnering. And once you have that um, kind of conversation with your organization or conversations with yourselves about, um, you know, what those needs are, um, this is just a framework on how you think about laying that out um, and making sure that everybody understands what piece of the puzzle uh, they are solving and how that puzzle comes together to create the, the entire picture. And so what we do is we look on the left at kind of the goals, and this is the kind of the broader goals of all the organizations. You look at um, the, the different, your organization as well as your partners, and you understand kind of which organizations are focusing on which things. And so you can, in my X, Y, Z, very simple example, the blue boxes, could be X, Y, Z, A, and B. Um, and you can define where you think you and your partner organizations are best suited uh, to create that full picture. And once you map that out and share it with your partners, I think everybody will understand uh, a little clearer, a little better, you know, what they're doing, how they're working with others um, to achieve this common overarching goal of whatever kind of problem or, or issue you're trying to solve. Um, so just another way to, to think about how to kind of marry up with others to reach, reach much bigger goals than your organization might be able to do uh, on, on your own. So with that, I'm going to pause for a second and um, see if there are questions or uh, thoughts on the framework. Um, Feedback is welcome on, on whether this resonates and whether this might be helpful. And then what we'll do is dive into a case study with uh, Almaz uh, to talk through ADN and how she has thought about kind of going through this exercise. Thank you, Beth. Um, there's a question from the audience about funding, um, that finding funders can be challenging. Do we have any suggestions? I know this is a pretty broad, um, you know, this could be covered in several webinars all by itself, but I think there is a way to maybe think about funders as these partners that you're working with to complement your um, areas of low capacity and, you know, how we can, um, how we, funders have needs also that they're trying to address in the market. And maybe we can think about the ways that our organizations can match up with them to be able to achieve those, um, those market needs. Yeah, absolutely. And, and and another thing I would say would be that, you know, I think funders really appreciate this, the clarity um, of an organization in really being able to articulate the strengths of that organization, where they fit in the ecosystem, and how they're leveraging other people to solve a greater problem. Um, and so, you know, insofar as this kind of framework can help you outline um, your value proposition, uh, taking that to funders can be uh, a lot more effective than going to someone and saying, you know, we're trying to do a million things and we need money for it. Um, so just that that kind of organization and, and the intentionality behind uh, a strategy can be an effective way to communicate with funders. Uh, and then as Sarah said, really understanding their needs. You know, it's always good to put yourself in the funder's shoes what are their programmatic areas or what are their focus areas? How do they think about their strategy? And then being able to draw a straight line between your strategy and your focus, their strategy and their focus, so that you can really, you can really kind of pitch how, how well aligned the two organizations are. Um, because, you know, funders are looking to give, to give or, or invest money, right? That, you know, they, they, they want to be getting money out. Um, and if you can do that in a way that is aligned with how they've set up their strategy, 
um, you know, I think it'll be it'll be an easier case to make. Great, thank you. There aren't any other questions from the audience at the moment, so I think we can go ahead. I'm just going to unmute Amaz, and then I'm going to put myself back on mute. Amaz, are you there? Yes, I am. Thanks, Sarah. Excellent. Okay, Beth, go ahead. Perfect. Thank you so much. Hi, Amaz. Hi, Beth. All right. Uh, so thank you so much for being our guinea pig. Um, <laughs> and uh, you know, I thought today we would uh, kind of work through uh, this, this kind of exercise or these kind of tools uh, with ADN, African the Diaspora Network, um, to kind of see how this works in real time. Um, and so what I'll do is, is I'll first ask you to just give a, a quick overview of the African Diaspora Network. Um, you know, when you were started, um, you know, what, what your mission is, uh, so that everybody has that as a background. And then um, we'll kind of go through question and answer on how you would use this framework to think about your strengths and your focus. Okay, so you want to give you, a quick Beth. background on? Yes, thank you, Beth and Sarah. Thank you for the opportunity and to uh, uh, network with others uh, doing the same thing or trying to do the same thing. Um, so the African Diaspora Network, it's a, it's a volunteer organization that we've started in uh, 2010 with the idea of what are we going to do to exchange resources and how are we going to exchange ideas and resources. I, we, I say this because we do have an amazing uh, diaspora with tremendous knowledge and resources, whether it's here in Silicon Valley or other parts of the Bay Area, plus in the United States and in other parts of the world. Uh, given my background, because I've done a lot of international economic business and economic development, I uh, said, well, maybe there is a, a way to do this. And so how? what if we put a group of people and uh, discuss our ideas? So we share this with uh, several uh, Africans and friends from Africa, um, the idea of uh, working together to discuss um, uh, challenges and come up with possible opportunities for for others to uh, use and that was the whole idea it's really mainly about knowledge and resource sharing we didn't intend to uh, be where we are today to be honest with you we just said okay we'll just give whatever information people are looking for but it ended up being more than that we have about 1500 in our database people got very interested in our idea and they start to join us uh, online, and uh, uh, we do a lot of convening as much as we can. Um, plus, we have a lot of uh, uh, wonderful partners. If anybody wants to get to know what we do, I really encourage you to go to our website, all done voluntarily by amazing uh, uh, alumni whom I went to USF. And so really, step out, the um, African diaspora is pretty much uh, – done by a group of volunteers from around the world, but mostly the operational aspect of it is done here in uh, in the Bay Area. I have a lot of support from the University of San Francisco students and uh, former students and current students. I am an alumni of USF, and then I also take advantage of Santa Clara University and Stanford. So in so many ways, I think the universities have been fantastic partners for us. That was the essence of how we started. Where we are today is a different story, and I like to answer these questions to you, Beth. So you go ahead and hopefully this helps to frame how we started, but where we are and how we started is a bit different. I think it's a, a, a great story to tell and uh, about kind of how that can evolve um, as your organization adapts to the changing needs of, of the network and the people that you're trying to serve. Um, so we'll start with just 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 the kind of self-reflection piece. So so what do you really see as your organization's greatest strength? I think our greatest strength is our network, uh, access to amazing intellectuals, business leaders, and community leaders throughout uh, the United States, and uh, I have to say in Europe and Africa, we have truly amazing contacts. That's really our network. Um, I say this with a lot of humility because uh, everybody has a lot of work to do, and yet they continue to provide us their insight and resources as much as they can. And when I say resource, I want to really clarify: uh, we never raised money, but we did raise for us. But we did raise money to uh, to support other uh, uh, other uh, causes. So let me just tell you. Uh, 
what I reflect is the kind of partnerships that we were able to form. If you look at our mission and vision, it's not necessarily to work only with Africans who are born in Africa. Really, our uh, platform is big. Uh, we do believe that there are amazing friends of Africa who spend their time in the continent and love the continent, want to do good in the continent. So they they really are part of uh, ADN. So our partners um, uh, come through our database because they found it to be very useful for their causes. So we ended up making a really amazing partnership, and I'll tell you who they are. One of them is the Institute of International Education, IIE, also funded by the State uh, Department, do amazing work here. Every year they bring women from Africa to uh, do fellowship and internship here in Silicon Valley. For a month, they have about 75 women from all over um, Africa and, and the Middle East just going to Cisco, Intel, and all these places. And because of our aligned um, connections in the community, uh, we were able to actually partner. And so every year, uh, a couple of uh, days of these women uh, are pretty much spent with the community from the African Diaspora Network. We have a, a conference that we do. We want to understand the uh, the needs of women in Africa, especially access to STEM, uh, where they are and how what we can do. That's one with IIE. The other one is was One World Children Fund, another uh, wonderful organization that's working with us on, on developing the next philanthropies of uh, uh, people from sub-Saharan Africa, mainly from Africa. And this is the idea is One World Children Fund, uh, again, you can go and online and see what they do. What they do is really they help individuals to raise money on behalf of a cause in the continent. It could be for children, it could be for education, it could be for shelter. And that money, 100% of the money goes to that uh, organization in the country. Uh, so we started this partnership about a year ago. Since then, we have identified three, uh, uh, three champions uh, from Nigeria, and we have one in the process from Ethiopia, and then another one from, uh, I believe, Zimbabwe. And we still are working to get another three, uh, three uh, champions. Why do we do this? I think this is where the network becomes meaningful, uh, to be able to work with other organizations because they have the core competency. They know what to do. What we're trying to do is to provide them access to the network. Probably this is where we are strong in providing access to individuals in the continent, but also here in the Bay Area. So th these are two very good examples of organizations that we work with, and we have intentional collaboration. Thank you. That that's great. No, I think uh, I think you have focused in on those those two great strengths, which is the network uh, and the partnerships you, you're creating. You're creating, and I think there is a you know a, a lot of tie between those two. I think there's a lot of symbiosis between the the, the, the partnerships you're creating and leveraging the network to make those partnerships successful. Um, and so when you think about your your resources, I know it's a volunteer based organization. Um, but, but the volunteers that are working with you, where are you guys spending your, your time and your money? So when you think about it within the context of these partnerships or, or your work, um, you know, what, what ends up taking up the, most, the majority of your time? So the, I know, I'm so glad you've asked that question. The majority of our time really is spent about uh, we will have two, three uh, convenings per year. We have one coming up on March 7 uh, of two in celebration of the International Women's Day, trying to find a co-sponsor or a sponsor. We're doing this with HP. I'm happy to say that HP is actually sponsoring this event on the 7th. Uh, so you really are looking at issues that matters to the community and finding the right speaker for that specific uh, uh, issue and getting the space and all of this. So you can imagine how much time it goes into planning these events. So we're spending in that because we care about what people care and we, we know the issue of women, uh, especially one, younger women, uh, African women leaders in, in, in not only in Silicon Valley, but I think throughout the world uh, is uh, thriving and yet there are a lot of gaps and we're trying to understand how do people make it and how, uh, you know, if they are not, what can we do to help as a community? So we spend our time uh, doing that. That's one. And then the other thing is, really, we are at a point we just got our uh, nonprofit status. So that was the reason why we couldn't raise money as well. We just uh, got a funding uh, 
now we have a nonprofit status, so we can start raising money. So we're now putting together, talking to Sarah. Uh, thank you, Sarah, for all the help you give us to try to do uh, either it's crowdfunding or what other funding sources do we have to actually raise money to hire someone because nobody is paid for this. I have to say it's a work of love, but very, very tiring. Uh, and at the same time, I am someone who doesn't say no, so I need to learn to do what you said best earlier, say no. Um, and very difficult to say no. And the other, where are, the other place where we're spending our time is responding to requests. I'll give you a very good example. This week, there is a global social uh, innovation uh, summit happening in San Jose, very close to my office. Uh, I'm going to be there speaking on the 19th. However, there are a uh, few Africans coming uh, to this conference, and their question for us was, can you introduce me to Silicon Valley Community Foundation? Can you introduce me to someone at Google, to someone at HP? So we get a lot of requests, and we do the very best we can to connect them. That doesn't mean always everybody gets what they ask, but we have never said no, uh, because we believe that was the, uh, the essence of why we started ADN. So we spend a lot of our time to try to make sure that we provide access to opportunities to those coming from uh, the continent. The other thing we do, and we do this because we want to, is to, to try to sign up a lot of the younger uh, youth leaders from uh, the social entrepreneurs from Africa to get access to GSBI, the Global Social Benefit Incubator at Santa Clara University. I have helped several of them apply. Uh, of course, they have to go through the whole process and hopefully some of them will get in and some of them may not, but it's a great experience for them. It's a great exposure. So we spend our time really supporting the requests of the network, and we found out there is a need, and that's why we believe that we need to raise the money now to actually support them better so we can hire a program coordinator uh, that is dedicated to make sure that they respond to these kind of requests. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and, and I think what I'm hearing from you is really interesting. I think, I think what I'm hearing is that there are um, it's almost like there are a thousand little things that you all do that add up into a lot of time and energy. Um, and so that the, the transition, you kind of transition you're trying to make is from taking that from being kind of in, an informal um, volunteer based uh, kind of set of activities to really putting value on that and really, really placing value on those introductions, placing value on those email connections, placing value on, um, the pipeline that you're creating for, you know, the, the way that you're creating opportunities for people to be connected um, and, and playing the role of that, like, like what I call connective tissue, um, is valuable and uh, trying to figure out, uh, and, and, is a, and kind of what I can hear is a big part of your strength, so trying to figure out how you articulate that value uh, to people who might be interested in funding so that you could take that and kind of uh, magnify it uh, by having a full-time person there. Does that resonate? Yes. Yeah. Oh, really, a lot. And, and it is very important that we have one, and we have really made an intention to make sure that this year we really develop the capacity if we are going to be sustainable. I know about Valley Creation. You know, I ran one of the largest social innovation network in Silicon Valley, and I'm very proud of the work we do. The reason it is what it is is because I have amazing support behind the scene, and it's also seed funded by a bunch of uh, corporations and individuals. Uh, to do that, you know, you always have to create value, but there is a limit to how much you can do for, uh, you know, by just volunteering. And we're very happy for what we've done so far. We are going to ask though the network if they really value what we do, they have to give back to the, to the organization and start supporting and create somebody who actually can be funded to make this to what it could be. Because we are in the heart of the valley where innovation and entrepreneurship is happening, I really want to see us spend our time supporting these kind of initiatives versus just spending our time on, I mean, my time and my uh, volunteers' time, all of us, uh, to uh, individually connect them and whether it works or not. We don't know. The other thing we lack, Beth, is the feedback loop. Uh, we don't know what, whether what we do. We know some, but not enough to know, does, is it, uh, do we know that through this collaboration and uh, connections that a lot of them made some relationship. We know some, but we don't know as many. And so it would be interesting to, for us to develop a feedback loop 
so we know whether what we do actually is benefiting the greater society. Yeah, absolutely. And in, in a way, that's that's kind of your 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 uh, impact data. So uh, kind of how we look exactly. at it is, you know, those, those are your metrics to show, um, you know, what you've done and what you've created that wouldn't be there um, if it weren't for your organization. Uh, and so defining that and creating those metrics um, and, and collecting them uh, will be, I'm sure, a big part in how you continue to, to define and discuss your, your value and your strengths. Yes, and that that's uh, – so, you know, all these wonderful things that you were saying earlier, too, I was just reminiscing on the the, uh, the need for funding, and then you were showing all the uh, different things that we need to have from the time card to uh, – um, I'm just looking at my notes. I wrote them down, the budget, and then what the external feedback is. Let me talk about the external stakeholders' feedback. Let me just say this to the entire – group that is online right now listening to this, I believe that there is a big challenge also with the Africans in the diaspora, like in any other diaspora groups. One of the, the, the challenges that any diaspora organization has is also there are ethnic diaspora. So you've got the Eritrean Community Center, the Ethiopian Community Center, the Sudanese Community Center, the Kenyan. So at some point, you can actually find yourself um, questioning whether what you do makes a difference to this community because it's very, very uh, focused on that community and everything needs to be just for that community. I come from a different perspective and that's just uh, how I see the world. I don't think it's one or the other. I think we could do both, but it's not always um, accepted. So I think there is a challenge of, uh, uh, I'm not sure whether it's uh, because everybody's tired of doing many things, and I know our community volunteers a lot, uh, but I think there is more of a resistance to such an umbrella. Um, oh, you know, I go to uh, to the Sudanese Community Center, so I really don't have much time for this. Uh, so you see a little bit of pushback, and that's something that we need to figure out as we go forward, how to mitigate, whether we use that as an opportunity, or we look at it as a challenge, and then how do we uh, make it workable for everyone. I think I think that's where the stakeholders, if you look at from the local perspective, maybe there isn't that much except for those uh, knowledge exchange uh, dialogues that we do. Uh, but if you look at it from the continent, uh, if I show with you on which one, one day we would like to do that is share these wonderful emails we get of thank you for doing this, thank you for doing that, um, they see the value. Uh, whereas in here, uh, People are busy and they have all kind of different things to do. So, and and the other thing is because you have very specific ethnic groups, organizations that are or country specific organizations that are also uh, trying to do uh, raise the money. And then finally, I just want to say that the other thing that we hear, and I was uh, I was participating in the grant makers, the human rights grant makers conference in San Francisco. I believe either Sarah or someone was there from Calvert. Um, was that many people expressed uh, their the challenge of requesting money from the diaspora because you know billions of dollars go back to the continent from from the diaspora as a remittance, and I really believe that people are just burned out giving, and that's one other challenge that we hear. Mhm. Absolutely, and so I think there's a lot of, a lot in there that. Um it kind of helps paint the picture of the broader context that you're working in. Um, yes. So that these, when you think about kind of the market problem or the, or the issue or the, the kind of community that you're working within, um, there is the kind of the, the ethnic diaspora um, pods that have kind of, you know, many, there many of the, the smaller uh, diaspora communities, there's this need for kind of a, a little bit of an umbrella under uh, over them. Um, so really showing that uh, there can there shared needs there's and, and potentially shared resources that could help um, kind of all of them if they if they come together um, and then really looking at uh, you know this issue of, of how you uh, you know how you connect them better and how you uh, how you get funding for them and how you um, how you really focus efforts on things that that are needed without kind of burning people out. 
um, because I think there is so much value in these networks, not only the, the remittances, not only the, the kind of cash flow, um, but also in the relationships. And so figuring out how, you know, if, if someone feels like they're burnt out on giving, uh, what are the other avenues that they can, um, you know, that they can take to engage with this community and to help the community? Um, and so all kind of, you know, issues out there that, that are existing in, in the broader context of the work that you're doing. Yep. Okay, great. And so when you think about the, um, you know, your strengths of your network and your partnerships, and then you think about that broader context and all the needs that are out there. Do you have do you have thoughts on what kind of organizations or what kinds of capabilities uh, you would look for in a strong partner? You know, my greatest strength is really, really just looking at the big picture and bringing people together to solve the social or whatever problem. It could be a business problem. Um, so I, I see this doing very easily and really without any effort for the work I do on a daily basis. What I am looking is that kind of partnership where I can actually um, see um, ADN partnering with another very strong in operations. Um, and then we could do the other part of the work, really getting the convening, the uh, incubation of ideas, and maybe piloting piloting projects, coming up with the uh, with the with the leveraging resources of other partners. Whereas I think what I really think that ADN could benefit from is a very strong partner in the operations and compliance and all the necessary paperwork that need to be done by, uh, by for uh, any five, uh, uh, 501c3 organization, uh, because that, I believe, is what takes time. The operations aspect of uh, any organization is very time-consuming. You know, you can vision and envision uh, as much as you can, but the operations is as part is a key part of sustaining the uh, any organization. Um, I would like to see uh, that ADN becomes because I, I I really believe that um, I really believe I strongly believe in partnership and collaboration and leveraging resources. Uh, I don't think that no one of us can solve such a huge complex social problem on our own. What I like to see is someone to look at what ADN is doing and find a very strong partner who can complement us on the operations aspect of it. Does it make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, it's almost, for lack of a better term, you know, you guys are, are doing a lot of the, what we would call kind of front office things. So kind of being out in the community, doing the uh, the convenings, uh, leveraging your networks. And what you're looking for is kind of the, the back office or the, um, you know, the, the, the plumbing uh, to make all of it work. Um, and I think that's, uh, you know, I, I'm sure there are organizations, you know, what I would, think would be to look at kind of some larger organizations that might have that, you know, in existence that could act as kind of a fiscal sponsor or a kind of operational sponsor in some ways um, to, for, for you all to leverage to make sure that that's not going to take up um, time of yours that would be better spent on uh, what you're really good at, which is kind of getting out there, getting, you know, making those connections and, and creating those partnerships. Yes. Yeah, I really think that's going to be a big uh, chunk of our thinking for this year because um, we have grown above and beyond our capacity. So we wanted to make sure that we continue what we what we believe is important to the community, but at the same time find someone to really become either the backbone organization to do all the, uh, like you said, the back office work, but also to support our uh, our work going forward. Uh, we have a couple of uh, organizations that we're thinking about, but then <laughs> alignment is always an, a challenge. How do you make that happen? That's something that we have to come back to you guys and just get your insight. Um, but it is it is uh, it is very important for any any diaspora or any other network to uh, become what it really wanted to do, which is uh, connect people to opportunities and resources. You really have to figure out how the other part of that, what you're not good, can be complemented. It's really working with your core competency, but find somebody else who can um, complement uh, with the, what you're trying to do. And that would be something we're interested in this year. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. 
Um, thank you so much. I, I want to pause there, and there's a couple of questions that have come in, and so um, and, and mostly po posed to Almez. And so uh, a couple of questions for you from the audience. Um, one was, how can an organization partner with the ADN? What, what are the opportunities to partner? Um, you know, I know we, we identified one specific way, you know, thing that you guys are looking for in a partner uh, in terms of that operational capacity, uh, but are, are there other ways to kind of plug in with the work that you're doing? Yes, and if you look, what we have done is we put all our partners on the website. What we do is we partner with organizations that uh, kind of complement and work with us on the specific things that we're trying to do, and which is really convening the knowledge exchange program that we've started uh, about a year ago, and we have three of them this year. Uh, first one is on March 7, as I said, and so if you have, um, if you uh, are someone who's interested in partnering on convening together, that's another thing we could do. The other uh, uh, part is, as I said, at this point, we really are looking for someone to become uh, a partner in becoming our really the back end the back, what is he called the back or the back office support mm -hmm. and that and and also the other one we're looking for is uh, another organization with similar vision and mission to jointly uh, look for funding because we've never did before we as I said we never raised money specifically for what we're trying to do we have raised the money and we supported that uh, to the Silicon Valley Africa Film Festival every money we raised in the last three years however amount it was went straight to the to support the film festival but this time we'd like to partner with another organization to do a joint fundraising um, uh, program that would be wonderful okay great thank you um, the next question is about this uh, this concept of finding a shared agenda uh, the question is, you know, that, that that is really tough in the African community. And, how, you know, how do you think about engaging with uh, the youth and kind of leveraging the youth entrepreneurial spirit um, to kind of make a difference and, and do work that matters? So how do you guys really think about engaging and incorporating um, that energy and excitement that's coming from the, the, the youth diaspora communities? Wonderful question. I actually like that question. Um, so here's what we do in very specific examples. I was asked to speak to a group of African uh, professionals from the diaspora in Auckland about uh, four weeks ago. And we've heard, and these were amazing, incredible, bright individuals, a lot of scientists, a lot of lawyers, a lot of, the, and then others in between, engineers and others in between trying to find a job because they just finished college. And some were just newly immigrated individuals. Their challenge, which was amazing through hearing what they were saying, I just said, oh, so they really do need someone to really explain to them how to actually make your innovation uh, a money-making, revenue-generating uh, business. And so with that, and this came from the discussion, and what we're doing is on April 4, we have a wonderful woman named Avery Kent. Um, she's going to speak about innovation uh, and entrepreneurship. It's going to be at Santa Clara University. So what we do is we look at what's needed in the community. We actually had to bypass another event in order to make sure that we get Avery at that moment. Uh, she was She's traveling to School Foundation, so I wanted to get her before she goes to Oxford. She's going to talk about not only just uh, how they can innovate, but also how they can innovate and bring other people without fear to try to raise money for their uh, for their uh, innovation. Um, so we look at what they are looking for and we try to become this conduit to make that happen for the community. The other one is uh, with Luam, uh, she's gonna come and be our keynote speaker for March 7. She's a young and incoming Eritrean choreographer, uh, very successful. She does this for Beyonce and all in, in New York, but that's not the big story of her. Her story is very beautiful. Her journey journey was very, very uh, painful. We wanted to find out how do you actually, as a younger African woman, which we are talking about uh, cultural dilemma, because uh, <laughs> your parents want you to be a doctor, an engineer, or something else in between, and then you end up saying, you know what, I don't really want to be a doctor. I actually want to go and become a choreographer. That is not acceptable. And so she went through a lot of the cultural biases, and we want to learn from her how, do, how did she come to be where she is without 
compromising the love and affection for her family. This is a big social issue in our community. So we thought, okay, we will bring someone who might be able to help our younger women and men to try to achieve their dreams without compromising the self, the person that who they are. But it's not always Thank easy you. to get a shared uh, agenda. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Beth, can I give a plug for our next webinar since it's on the, the same topic? Um, IDEA will be hosting a webinar on engaging the, le the next generation of diasporas, um, you know, engaging millennials. And that webinar will be on March 31st at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Um, we'll follow up with people by email about details for that webinar. But if you're interested in that topic, how to engage youth and the work that you're doing, you should definitely tune in for that. And Beth, I'm, thank you. We're um, we're running short on time; just a few minutes left. I know you have a lot to cover still. Yeah. So just uh, just there's a couple of more questions that a couple of other questions that have come in from the audience, um, and then we'll do a quick wrap up. Um, uh, so one more question for Ahmed. So it, the question was, what is the best way to approach a potential partner? Um, and we'll actually combine these questions. So, so one is that is is how to approach a potential partner. Um, so, is there any kind of secret sauce there? And then the second question is around kind of collaboration and cooperation, um, and whether or not people are actually willing to re relinquish the glory. I love that thing um, in, in doing so. So, how do you approach people, and how do you how do you make sure that that people know that you're open to collaboration, um, even if it means that you're not going to get all of the credit? Yeah, and you know what? I actually am at a point in my life that I don't need credit. <laughs> Honestly, I don't. I actually start collaboration always from the greater good of the community. What is it that we're going to do together that is going to benefit the community? That's where I start, uh, and I'm guilty of that. Uh, some people kind of look at, oh, well, you know, but I want something for myself. What? I don't, I don't ever remember me being successful when I think of everything for me. Uh, I think this is just, I'm talking about the way in which I have approached collaboration. Always I start with what are we going to do for the greater good of the, that's the essence of ADN and, and even the work I do step up is what is it that we're going to do? And I have to tell you, it's an incredible sense of joy when I see that we relinquish every ego that we had because we really do believe that we have something bigger. We're working on something bigger than ourselves. That's how I approach collaboration. And so far, uh, it doesn't mean it's always easy, but so far I don't really know I can complain. They are willing to do it. Where we are having a hard time is uh, because we just start to see ourselves growing beyond our capacity is really getting that the partnership to raise money together that we have done. And I'm really looking to dive into uh, that part of the discussion, which may create a little bit more headache. Uh, but so far, um, I am open. I will remain open, but I really don't start anything from what's in there for me. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think that's right, and I, I think that's probably common to a lot of the folks in the community. Um, and I, you know, just one thing I would add about the, the how to approach a potential partner. I mean, I think um, some of this, the the framework that we've walked through, um, in in being able to really articulate your strengths and what you have to offer. Um, and then articulating what you think the partner has to offer and how that is complementary um, can be a great way to approach someone um, and, and really say directly, um, you, know, you know, this is who we are and this is what we bring. Uh, this is what we see, uh, you know, what, what you guys bring to the table. And it would be really great to explore ways to see if that, you know, if those can really fit together uh, to, you know, kind of achieve our, our joint mission of X. Um, and so, I think being able to, to really spell that out up front is is helpful in making those connect those partnership connections. Um, and so with that, we're just going to wrap up quickly, uh, and then Sarah will kind of officially wrap us up. But um, you know, I think a after you go through these exercises and as you hear the the uh, the great kind of case study of the ADN, um, you can then figure out how to turn that assessment or that that reflection of uh, strengths and of, of opportunities into action. So you can, you know, ask yourself questions uh, like you see here on the screen, which is, you know, how do you see opportunities to leverage those strengths? How do you kind of double down on what you're good at um, and start to kind of divest of the, th you know, divest the activities that, that you feel are not aligned um, with, with your strengths? Uh, and how do you 
put those put that effectively into words. I mean, so much of what we do is about communicating our value, uh, and and that was a, a great piece of what Almad said about really knowing and understanding and communicating that value to uh, to potential funders or potential partners. Um, you know, how do you identify those those complementary resources or skills that are needed? So in ADN's case, you know, it's really that operational piece that's missing that that she's looking for. Um, so, so in this way, you know, in identifying what she's good at, she also identified what she feels like she, where, you know, where she's lacking. Um, so how do you then go find those resources to, to fill those gaps? Um, and then how do you, you know, how do you put together that puzzle? How do you formalize that puzzle of partnerships um, to, to create greater impact or reach more of the community needs? Um, and so this is just, um, you know, a couple of, of questions to tee up to say, okay, um, after you've reflected on, on those strengths and, and how you fit into the, the, broader, uh, the broader puzzle, you know, what, what can you then go do? Um, and I think a lot of the great things that, that happens within the IDEA network is being able to create those connections, create those new partnerships um, to, to formalize uh, that kind of uh, broader, uh, that, that broader mosaic of, of organizations all, all trying to achieve the same goals. So with that, I will uh, conclude and thank Ahmed so much for being our guinea pig. Um, thank, thank you guys you all for much. listening. Um, and Sarah, I'll turn it back over to you to officially uh, sign us off. <laughs> Thanks, Beth. Um, this has been extremely helpful and people in the chat box are saying so. Um, I, you know, this is one of the more concise and helpful strategy sessions I've actually been a part of. I think the three steps, you know, understanding what you're good at, the understanding the needs of the community and understanding how to partner to fill those gaps is a really good place to start, especially if you haven't done a lot of strategy work in the past. So thank you for bringing us these, um, the sort of framework for us to think about. And Almaz, it's so helpful to be able to go through, um, you know, a framework like this with an example. And I appreciate you sort of opening up your, um, <laughs> you know, opening everything up and sharing with us your experiences and how you guys are continually working to find your focus. So thank you both very much and thank you to the audience. Um, we'll be following much. up with the recording as well afterwards. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sarah and Beth. Thanks a lot. Thank you, guys. Have a good afternoon. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye.